and welcome to Landscape Photography World, a podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Stanley R. Yanto is an award-winning travel and landscape photographer who's explored 29 countries worldwide. He's won over 100 international awards and been published in magazines like Canadian Geographic and exhibited in countries like Australia, US and Japan. To Stanley, a photograph is more than just an image. It's a translation of what you see and experience in our passage in time. It transforms the feeling from the past to the present. It touches our imagination and conveys a story. Stanley has his own podcast, The Art of Photography, and owns The Wicked Hunt, a photography company that helps to inspire people to get outdoors and take great photos. We talk about how his style has developed, how his upbringing shaped his philosophy towards photography, along with a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Stanley. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Hey, good day, Grant. It's good to be here. Um, I'm good. I'm just back here in Perth for um, since 2019, so it's been a good while. Wow. Yeah. So what were you doing in Bali? You, you got stuck there during uh, the pandemic, I assume. Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, you know, in 2018, I kind of left my um, career as a mechanical engineer to pursue, you know, travel and photography. Cool. And I flew to Canada and stayed there for two and a half years under um, international experience. Um, I think they call it, you know, something fancy like that, but it's essentially it's a working holiday visa. So yeah, that was incredible because I get to explore the Canadian Rockies and I get to like learn a whole bunch of adventures, um, you know, like backcountry snowboarding, avalanche um, training and um, and so forth. So towards the end of that, um, that time there, um i when um i had to go back now that was during the covid era um, era so Mm -hmm. going back to australia was like six grand worth of one trip that's not including the the isolation which another two grand on top wow um and my grandma was getting old at that time she was 98 um at that time and you know um i I decided I, I want to go back to Indonesia, you know, um, not only because it's cheaper, but also to visit her because, oh, you know, sure. I don't know when else I'm going to be I able like to this, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know how, how long we got locked out here in Australia, right? Exactly. Which was a really good decision because, you know, like um, earlier this year, she passed away. So I get to spend my last, um, her, lot, uh, her last year. Um, you know, with me, and that's that's great. So awesome. yeah, that's that's a little bit of story. So I'm I'm kind of just you know you know um settling myself there for now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure when I'm gonna start traveling again. Whether I'm gonna make Bali as the base, but I'm pretty much nomadic. I live off my luggage. Um, you know, I don't need anything else apart from my luggages. Uh, well, my luggage, my backpack, and my laptop bag, and that's pretty much it. Wow. Okay. So. Talk to me, why have you got this passion for getting out into the world and uh, travelling around and why why become a nomad and why landscape photography is part of it? Yeah. It's, it's, is, it's, is it the nomadic life that attracts you or is it the photography that attracts you and makes you do the nomad, no, nomadic life? Yeah, it's it's interesting, right, because it's like um, chicken and egg, right, good choice hmm. first. Uh, but for me, I didn't start photography um, for a little while. I started um, traveling, right, um, My my and I didn't even like traveling at that time. You know, I, I was um, I grew up on um, fairly low income family and my parents was working their ass off right to to get um, to get us by. So when I got, you know, a job and stuff, all I think about was like, you know, saving, saving, get like nice things. Right. Because that's what I didn't get to have when I was a kid. Now, six years in. Well, actually earlier um, than that, about two, three years, um, I had this bad breakup with my um, girlfriend at that time. And. I didn't like traveling, but I just kind of felt stuck, right? Um, and yeah. I was like, I had to go back for my grandma's um, grandma birthday at that time. Um, and I decided to spend just a few days longer in Bali. So that was my very first solo trip, pretty much. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't even know if that counts because my friends was there. So I get to hang out with them as well. But 
since then i've been to 25 countries right ever since i had that breakup i have been to 25 countries and the big um changing moment is when i travel five weeks in europe mm -hmm. it was such an incredible trip i had a lot of fun but i just don't have any photo to remember you know the experience by it was just like yeah. It's like, that's, that's not it. Like, you know, and uh, that's when I decide if I'm going to go travel anyway, why not, you know, capture these places, like how all of these people capturing it in, yeah. um, in, in Instagram and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. um, I start thinking, you know, what, what to get, how, how can I improve and stuff like that. But the big thing that really, you know, pushed me was when I saw uh, one of the local photographer here, actually, he's, um he's a, he's a legend in astrophotography. And I saw his photo, just um a, a panorama of Milky Way curving above one of the sand dunes here in Western Australia. Yep. And then I saw that I was like, I want to be able to, you know, take photos and it's just like that. So ever since then, it was just, you know, um, everything that I do, it was how I can, uh, how I can get there. How can I yeah, take this yeah, photo? Yeah. And over time that kind of just developed, you know, and I realized um, around 2016, mm -hmm. I realized that, you know, if I want to be able to go to all of these places and capture all of, and see all of this beautiful um, scenery landscape, right. And capture them with my camera working full time is not going to cut it because I'm not going to have the time to do that. Right. And yeah. mind you, right. At that time, I used to have this calendar on, on my, on my wall at, at work. And I used to book like a year in advance. So as soon as the schedule of the flight tickets out, I already know. Right. <laughs> and yeah, sure. I, I would just like use all of the work, um, uh, the holidays and uh, school holidays and all stuff and line it up to save all of my um, um you know my leave but yeah that's that's pretty much how I got to it and um you know over that you know it just kind of developed like I I fall in love with adventure start you know summiting mountains mm -hmm. um doing um kind of night hikes and stuff like that and it's it's just about curiosity of you know what what is that and you kind of give it a try and at some point it's either a yes or a no right and um for me that's that's how i curate my life to this point it's like okay well there's you know i don't know what i'm gonna do but i'm just gonna try it and then if, if it's if it's a yes then i'm gonna keep doing it if at some point it become a no then i'm just gonna drop it and move on and ever since i had that um that breakup that's that's always been my principle you know, um, I'm never going to let um, life dictate um, because I want to be comfortable or I'm scared of change. And instead, it's just, well, if it still serves me, if I still like it, then I'll keep doing it. If not, then there is, you know, I have the ability to change that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess it sounds to me like a lot of it is around that control in your life and being able to control your circumstances. That said, you're going into some environments that are quite challenging uh, and, you know, you've experienced, uh, you know, conditions on the tops of mountains and, uh, you know, Arctic conditions and all the rest of that sort of thing. Um how much control do you want to have around those elements and you know how much does that influence when you pick and choose where to go yeah it's it's always hard right um at the end of the day it's all about what i want to see and what i want to experience and everything i'll just try to manage right yeah. so um kind of rolling back a little bit you know all my life um growing up in an, an indonesian kind of um, culture mm -hmm. it's all about control right you have yeah. to go get good grades you have to go to school you have so when i quit my job it felt so scary because no one you know no one i've ever heard um no one from indonesia i've ever heard done this right yeah. so it was something new especially in my family right my parents are both doctors and they're you know living a very secure sort of uh, progression yeah. um, so when i when i go uh, when i quit um 
it becomes about embracing the change, embracing the challenges, embracing um, the pain, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the one of the um, the hardest hike that we had was going up this mountain top because we want to see the aurora. Now, the problem at that time was when I was in Canadian Rockies, we have to go quite high up to see the auroras because usually we don't, we're, we're quite further south and we have to see in the horizon and there is a lot of mountains everywhere. Yeah. So we had to go higher so that we could see the horizon, right? Now, the problem was at that time, it was um, full of clouds. Um, it was a negative 30 degree winter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, so then we look at it, we look at different spot. One of the spot that we want to go, we're like, ah, man, it's all fully clouded. You know, one of my friends just came from there and then kind of step out. I was like pretty disappointed coming back from work. And I look up and I was like, it's clear sky here. Why not just go one of the mountain here? So we ended up just start packing and then we start skiing up the mountain. I think we started around 10 PM. We got there around one, if I'm not wrong. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's I have it was one of the most memorable experience and and photos that I've ever captured. Um, but coming back to what you say, it's kind of a long way to to answer that question. Sure, is sure. Um, how do I how do I decide? It's it's about deciding what you want to see, what you love, uh, what you love instead of what you're scared of, and then managing your fear afterwards. In mm-hmm. and, and that's the, the definition of passion, you know, like when you're passionate about something, you, you push through and you you find the courage to overcome the fear and you just manage the fear. Yeah. And I think that is the biggest lesson that I've learned from from my life and from doing this. Okay. And do you think it's that that fear and that control of the fear that is what motivates you the most creatively? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, it, it's, it's really difficult, right? And um, I, I, I found this out actually just earlier this year that um, we need uh, both things. We need, we need a certainty and we need change in life, right? Yeah. How much is depend on people's personality? Now, mm. I realize that, you know, if you now... I think you will see a lot of people are feeling this, right? Um, especially artists, right? Because we're kind of known with the, you know, the broke artist mindset and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And I think that is because um, when we hustle and try to find income to to make us live, right? We can't be creative, right? Yeah. When we're in a survival mode, we can't be creative. And actually a, a good, um, a, a good example is like when you see a, a, a lion, right? You're not going to go, Hmm, where should I go on my next adventure? You know, <laughs> you're not going to think like that, but yeah. you're going to think, Oh, how, how do I stay alive? Right? Yep. So what drives me is definitely the adventure, the changes, the things that's exciting. Right. But it's, I, I find that I need to have a security as well. And that security is depend for everyone. And, you know, for me, and that's why I like to do a slower trip. So even though I'm nomadic, I like to, you know, kind of base here for three months or a year or two year or whatever it may be. Right. And then move on to the next one. And that kind of give me the security that I need instead of, you know, hopping like every three days and stuff. I'm I'm kind of done doing that. Cool. So what is it that you're really chasing the most in your photography in particular? Less so the adventure side of things, because that's obviously the experiential side, but in terms of your art and creating something out of that experience, what is it that you're you're really chasing? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um I think um for me, experience always comes first. And it's all about capturing the experience and being able to share that to, you know, my friends, my family or my followers, right. Um, And my community. And that is the main thing. So when people say it's like, well, what would you go out? It's, it's such a bad weather. Well, actually I want to go out and experience that and being able to portray that bad weather. I think that would be something um, exciting for me, right? Um, a, a challenge rather, um, if it's, if it's, you know, not, not easy to take and so forth. Um, but in terms of photography, I think 
one of the things that um, is important for me is to find unique perspectives of the world. And it's sure. when I started photography, I think that is one of my goal or my mission is that I want to challenge myself and look beyond the obvious, right? I want to challenge myself and s slow myself down to see and observe the things that most people missed out on, right? Yeah. And I think as photographers, we have the 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 responsibility to to share that because most of the time we are out there mm -hmm. observing and seeing and capturing this well as most people probably only go there once right and then they, they would never go there again they would go to a different location but we would go there over and over and over again so some of the condition that we've captured might never been seen by anyone else mm. yeah so do you think it's important to, and, and do you have projects that you work on and goals in within those projects, or do you tend to be a little bit more spontaneous in how you develop your work? Yeah, that's that's interesting because um, I do have project, but my project uh, revolves around the destination and the experiences, yep. right? Um, so, for example, one of my uh, my goal in in Canada was to be able to capture Aurora and Milky Way from from the summit, right? And that, that become the project, that become the passion, yep, yep. Uh, you know. And then um, there was a time where I wanted to chase, um, not chase, but explore the glacier and the ice caves and stuff like that. And you know, at, you know, around that whatever time frame that I have to be able to do that, I would just look and find different places that I can go to be able to find that. So my project are more about the location instead uh -huh. of like, um, you know, in, instead of uh, a certain topic or, or sort of thing. So one of the things that I want to be able to experience next, for example, is to be able to go to Iceland or even go to the 8,000ers uh, mountain top um, in Nepal one day. Um, yeah. And that, that is, you know, like another project kind of thing, you know, so. Yeah. Speak, so. so what are you doing in terms of planning those things? Are you, I mean, you, you mentioned that you, you were, when you were working, booking a year ahead. Now that you're full-time in photography are you doing things differently are you spending as much time planning or do you spend a little bit less time planning and it you know you might be more spontaneous and you say all right well i feel like going to iceland next week let's go you know? yeah uh it, it that definitely has changed um i think the planning is more about the responsibilities that I need to to do, right? Um, yeah, so yeah. For example, um, right now, um, I want to be in Perth because my niece's birthday, you know, the other day, and I want to be with the family. That's probably, you know, one, one of the things that I want to work around. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other things is also weather, right? Um, timing of the year, as well as usually I would plan everything around the Milky Way because I'm such a big lover of astrophotography and it's it's the, it's what got me started into photography, right? So everywhere I go, I would look for a composition um, where I can incorporate the Milky Way. So when I do hiking and stuff like that, I usually look at for the new moon instead of the full moon. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and how much time would you spend in uh, in in that planning? I guess the, the the planning phase of your your journeys. Yeah, the planning is really difficult because um, I used to be a person that want to plan everything to like the smallest t right mm -hmm. uh, but that kind of changed now i have like the bucket list of that trip so i want to do this 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 and that yep. and i let everything kind of just flow like water right wherever it goes whatever cracks it's fine yeah. and i don't like to put pressure on myself and saying like you know what i'm going to france and i want to be able to see the eiffel tower for example yep. so my whole philosophy is that when I travel and when I go on a trip, um, I have these certain things that I want to see, right? Like everybody else does. But if I find a place or if I stop by a place that I really like, I'm okay to not go to the next one or miss out the next one. Because, sure, sure. you know, there's always next time, right? And uh, yep. it's a good reason to, to come back. 
So that is one of the big reason around. Uh, th there is one of the big um point around 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 my planning. Yep. Um, having said that, when I start planning, you know, the composition and everything, I look into it very detailed in terms of weather, in terms of um like the lineup with the Milky Way, right? Where it's gonna be? What sort of composition I'll be looking at? Um and it's it's never gonna be the same anyway when you get there because you, yeah. you get there and you go like oh the mountains actually on you know different side or you know I miss you know the 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 AR is not hundred percent true or there is no foreground here so it's a little bit of both but I find yeah. that especially for night photography it's important to plan it because it's hard to find composition when it's dark <laughs> so okay. usually most of my milky way shot are um you know i i would pass it during the day and i'll start looking at a few different things pull out my photo pills line things up look at where the composition gonna be and mm -hmm. come back to that spot for the night time yeah okay okay what's the next exciting project you're planning to get into Ooh, I've, I've got a, quite a few, actually, you know, that I, I'm passionate about is the, the country where I was born. So um, I wanted to explore more of Indonesia, um, especially yep. the places that are a little bit more untouched, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, Bali, Java is very common. People are going there. Yeah, I want it's to a be able big to holiday go. destination, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, right? And, you know, the, the population as well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big population. Yeah. So a lot of the local photographer have been there and so forth. Uh, but, you know, I'd love to be able to branch out a little bit more and go to more isolated places. But, you know, at, at the moment, I'm I'm kind of focusing on my business right now because um, the first two years I did this, I was basically doing so much adventure that I didn't focus on my on my business <laughs> so that that was a problem when 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 you know when it comes to to the COVID time that's when I was kind of like sit down and start thinking you know okay I need to you know work on my business or so to speak so so yeah um my next project is basically that, but um, I'm working a lot on other projects as well. So, for example, you know, uh, I'm building a travel photography backpack that um, I'm hoping to um, release and I'm hoping to um, be able to help photographers out there who is, you know, struggling to find the, the backpack that suits their style, right? Um, and, you know, I'm also working on... Um, a travel sort of trips around Indonesia as well, okay. where we want to go to, like I said earlier, we want to take people to more secluded places. Yeah. But we want to also make sure we contribute to the local community and local artists. Yeah. And you know, I'm thinking to utilize NFT in that in that sense as well, you know, where we yeah. get the local artists, we turn that into NFT, people buy the NFT and that kind of contribute to the local artists and then X percent go to the local NGO to help their costs. And then, you know, of course, the rest is to keep our business going and do more of this so that we can uh, make more changes to, to to the rest of, you know, Indonesia. Excellent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's some of the project that I have. Um, photography wise, Greenland, I think Greenland yeah. is high on my bucket list, hundred percent. Yeah, I think the the uh, the opportunities for getting into uh, places like Greenland are uh, you know started to open up recently, which um, you know it, it's always been somewhere that's been very difficult to get into or you know challenging to uh, to try and uh, and get around. Uh, I think. So, yeah, I, I think that would be a very interesting uh, little project to, to get into. Yeah, Green Greenland is um, – so I heard or, you know, seen Greenland from Paul Ziska. I'm not sure if you see, um, yep. know him. But he's, um, he's one of my mentors. Um, he's – one day I went to his uh, event and then he was like, oh, yeah, I'll, yeah, let's let's set up a, a coffee meet. And he showed me everything about Greenland. It's like, oh, you should go here, you should go here. And then you take this to go here. And I was like, 
man, it's it's incredible. And yeah. those are actually some of the places that I love to visit, you know, like, because not many people have gone there before, right? Mm. Not many people have seen them. Like, Iceland is beautiful, right? I've seen them over and over again. And I still do want to go there, but I would rather go somewhere that is less untouched and less seen because my goal is to be able to find that new perspective and be able to show people you know, a, a piece of the world that people haven't seen or experienced before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm interested also in your approach to photography as it relates to the experience, but also how that sort of transcends into art. And you mentioned, you know, being an artist and, uh, and so forth. Some photographers don't see themselves as artists per se because they're recording and documenting. They're more documentary photographers and they take what they see. Where do you sit on the spectrum between, you know, where it merges into digital art or, uh, you know, are, are you more trying to show something that's a very true representation of what you, uh, what you see? I think I'm a little bit in be in between, but one thing that, um, you know, I had a lot of think about this actually when I first started is like, you know, what makes people a photographer and what makes people non-photographer. And at the end of the day, it's about the definition that they put around that word, right? Mm. I mean, art is something that evokes emotion, right? Definitely. It could be, I mean, I'm sure you have seen this square, you know, like three squares or whatever with three different colors and people yeah. call it art because to some people that evoke emotion, it might not evoke emotion to you personally. And you go like, this is ridiculous, right? But other people relate to that and evoke their emotion. So even people who simply capture and document, you know, um, uh, the scene or uh, uh, an event and so forth, I think it's still an art, right? Because out of those chaotic movement and everything, they are looking for those emotional evoked uh, moments, capture yeah. them and also process them in a way that uh, it can relate or evoke, you know, the audience um, um, emotion. The visual impact has, has to have something that drags you either into the scene or, you know, as, as you say, promote some kind of, it might be revulsion, but it might also be, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. 100%, right? That's that's exactly right. So for me, I think um, I like to, I, um, I create, for example, I take the Milky Way and most of my photos and Milky Way shots is actually a single shot. Um, you know, I don't even do um focus stacking or i do some of them but i don't do much of them mm. and one of the main reason about that is because i feel like if i started to create a composite out of you know um things that you could find on the web and stuff like that i just become lazy i know i'll become lazy and it's like why do why bother hiking that mountains so i could just you know, right. do a composite right <laughs> so one of the motivation for me is just to experience, right? And I think it's important for every photographer to understand that why. I know some people who love to do um, composites, right? right? And I have nothing against them. And it, it's all about why they do that, right? Some people want to create these dreamy images and stuff like that. And I mm. respect that. But when people try to do a composite photo so that they could claim or, you know, they can have this um, self-right or, you know, um, uh, people praising them for something that they haven't done, then that's where I feel like that's yeah. where the ethical line should, should, should be at. Sure, but sure. yeah, for, I mean, I don't, um, I don't, I alter, um, you know, um, colors, right. When it's, when it's um, changing, you know, like the white balance and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, to get it right or to get it more purple and stuff like that. I do a lot of dodging and burning. Uh, but in most cases, most of my photography are single shot. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Are you going into the field with that in mind? And how does one, one of the things that uh, I'm always interested in exploring is that nexus between the place you are taking your photos 
and therefore the subject that you're taking and the how, the technical side of how you're actually taking that photo and which one dictates to you what you're going to do in any given event. I always start with the vision. Um, you know, when when I first start teaching and I was like, I kind of have to break down my workflow, right? I, I come to realize that there are three things that you need to master in photography. First is the vision, second mm -hmm. is the tool, and the third is the processing, right? In a nutshell, if you master that, you become a great photographer. So why you start with the vision, right? Because photography at the end of the day is capturing the light, capturing the moment, right? The true yeah. definition of photography is capturing the light, right? So. With that in mind, to be able to capture a good photo, you need to be able to recognize a good scene, right? And you need to be able to recognize how to capture them. And once you do that, then you can learn how you can um, use the tool that you have. And this is where it's important because your tool could be a phone. It could be a, right. a, yeah. a compact camera or it could be a massive DSLR or it could be a drone, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um and and by understanding your tool and mastering your tool, you can get the most out of it. And then you tie that with the post-processing side where you can either add your own personality to it, right? Um, have a certain color, a certain way, a certain experience through dodging and burning, right? This is what Ansel Adams is so good, right? You can create yeah. an entirely different experience just with dodging and burning. Um, and also to push the limit of your camera. I know that, um, you know, the more basic your photography, the better you should be at post-processing because that's how you can get the most out of your photo. Sure, sure, sure. So how do you convey that feeling of standing on the, on the mountain through your art, through your style? What is it about your style that you think is that communicative element that makes the person viewing it say, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's definitely Stanley and that's a, that's a place that I recognise or, you know, a scene that I, I recognise. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if people can see my photography and they say, go like, well, you know, that's, that's Stanley. But I know there are a few iconic shots that no one ever taken. And I know I... It was the only composition that up, uh, you know, that that is unique to to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. That even if you're gonna go through like you know Google and stuff like that, it won't be there. And it's not again like for me, it's a matter of creating that scene to to create that uniqueness instead of um, doing that in the post. Um, I know some people have that really recognizable signature. Um, I can say that um I don't think I'm there yet because <laughs> I I, yeah. I do have a lot of interest and when I look at different things I was like uh, I like that a little bit more vibrant or um I like that a little bit more you know map like not as vibrant yeah. and it all depends on the scenery for me mm -hmm. so if you look at some of my photos um you know there are um a few different um I mean more than a few I have like a good handful of photos that people can look at it and know exactly that that is mine because I know no one would ever, um, you know, um, no one have captured it that way, yeah, um, sure, especially sure. with the, the moments yeah, sure. or the time. So I think that is what what is my passion is actually chasing those moments. And it's more reason why I love to do the single shot as well because mm -hmm. I'm more passionate about chasing the moment instead of creating it, if yeah. that makes sense. Okay. So how do you define success in your photography? Ooh, that's that's a difficult question. That's a really good question. How do you define success in photography? Um that is definitely something that's um that's that's hard because um everyone have a different definition. Yeah, absolutely. Definition, right? So what what's yours? Uh, but yeah, yeah. For me it's always come back to uh, yeah. or a color or a condition that is unique to myself, right? that I truly came up with. Because um, I know it's really easy to fall in the trap of 
Oh yeah, yeah. You know, person A um, captured this before in Instagram at this time, at this day, at this season, and it looks beautiful. I want a photo like that, right? Yeah, sure, and sure. I started, I started with that. That's how I started my. Yeah, well, you you learn by copying. Otherwise, it's very difficult to go out on your own and and develop something from from nothing without having seen other work. Hundred percent. But what I didn't know was that that should be the learning curve instead of that's what you should be doing. Sure, so, sure. <laughs> I thought that was, that's why that's how people do it. You know, you just, you look at what people do and then you capture what they captured and you that's just go cool. like, yeah, this is mine, which exactly look the same with the next person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, I always, um, the success, right. Uh, some of the photos that I'm truly proud of is when, um, for example, this photo, um, uh, one of my favorite photo is um, where it was taken in on top of um, highest volcano in, in Mount Agung, right? Yep. And we hike up in the middle of the night. It, it was a really good story go- leading up to it because um, we there was two different summit. One of them was a little bit shorter on the east side. And one of them, the true summit is like you kind of go up, you go around the mountain and then you go another up and then you get to the summit. So I wanted to go to the true summit and my friend thought we were going to the other summit. So we're like taking our time and just before the top, right? Yep. Um, she was like, okay, that's, see, it's close. We already see the summit. It's like, that's not the summit. It's like, yes, it is. It's like, no, it's not. And then we look at each other and we're like, no. <laughs> it's then we realize we got every, you know, misunderstanding there. But we got there, um, you know, it was the last season of the Milky Way, the last week of the season of the Milky Way last right. year. So in 2021, right? So that was the last chance. And the forecast was clouded over, right? Um, I look at it, I studied it, and I realized that it was a low cloud. So we went anyway. And when we got there, we have one of the most incredible condition because we have this beautiful sea of clouds underneath it and the Milky Way is rise above it. And it actually helped a lot because the cloud diffused the, the light pollution. So, you know, without the cloud, I won't be able to see the Milky Way that vibrant. Yeah. So I think one of the uh, the most, the, the proudest photography that I've taken is where I have a great story behind it, where I have a great struggle when I went against every odds there is and mm-hmm. still managed to, find something different um, because, you know, like most people don't want to go out there when the weather's rough or when, you know, it looks like it's not going to be a good day, but yeah. actually you never know until you go out there. No, that's it. I mean, I, I think it's almost always worth going out, maybe not to the top of, uh, you know, um, a, a, an active volcano. There's sometimes when you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's almost always worth going out and getting uh, out into the environment because you know you never know what it's what you're going to see. It's it's always a challenge. Yeah, and most, a lot of my photos that is like one of a kind is because of that, right? It was negative forty degrees and everyone was sleeping, and I was like, I'm going to go out. This is going to be something good happening, and you know, I managed to see a light pillars, for example, or. Yeah. Sure. Um, a, a moon halo or whatever it may be, right? And the harshest, the harsh condition is actually the things that makes things the the the, the one that make things interesting, especially mm. in in the landscape photography or adventure photography, because those are the moments that most people, well, actually everyone rarely seen right because most That's people right. don't go out during the hard they, they go and hide <laughs> exactly exactly and it's actually it's one of the reason why i love night photos as well because yeah. you know it's uh yeah. it, most people are just sleeping right so when they That's see right. that they go like wow can you actually see that it's like you'd be surprised how much you can see absolutely absolutely i want to move on you've got yourself a podcast of your own and uh you know i want to thank you that I was uh, one of your guests recently. Um, talk to me a little bit about how that started and why you why you decided to get into podcasting as well. That's actually a really interesting. Um, it, it was interesting a story. Um, it, it was great to have you there. It was um, one of the most interesting story we had. Um, so 
how we get started was basically in 2020, I think, during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hit this wall of, I'm starting to hate my photography, right? I just get bored yeah. of photography and I was like, I'm hitting a burnout, basically. Um, and at that time, I was thinking to myself, how does this other professionals does it, right? Like, mm -hmm. how do they go through, like, what what struggle they have to go through um so the main reason why i started but uh the podcast was to to battle um imposter syndrome by sharing right. um yeah. other people's journey right because just because you see people having 100,000 followers on instagram it doesn't happen overnight i know it's really easy to see it that way but man it's a lot of work you know they have to be consistent they have to yep. post every day they have to make sure that the, the post is high quality um the copy um you know research around hashtags around you know everything right so there's a lot of things now with the new era of social media we got this false perception that everything should happen very quick right yeah. um that you go into Instagram and suddenly you have 10,000 followers. It doesn't happen that way. Um, right. You have to put a lot of work. So when I started, you know, um, asking people, other, sorry, other photographers and so forth, um, when I start asking people, other photographers and who's been in the industry for a long, long time, that's when I realized that just because they're very successful today, right doesn't mean they're not doing anything yesterday they have been building this over and over and over again they have been failing they have been going through all of the challenges that everyone goes through right oh, and yeah. one day something happened and it makes all the difference right yeah. and a good example is kath Sim simard right and yeah. i know she's a really great photographer she have a really unique style really unique eye as well like she her vision yeah. is just incredible yeah. right um, but, it, you know, for a long time, she was struggling, um, you know, even in the NFT industry, when she started, you know, people kind of like buy one, buy two, but don't know really, you know, who she is. But one day it just kind of happened and it's just exponentially goes, right? She went um, to one of the most renowned NFT photographer in, in the space. So I'd like to say that, you know, a lot of this thing is um, we, for every struggle that we've gone through, every failure, every things that, you know, hard, hard times that we've gone through, we're just preparing for our big day. And, you know, when that big day come, that's when you, you, you better be ready because it will come. If you keep going, if you keep finding your path, um, you know, after asking, after interviewing 40, 46 people now, right? they always find a way it's just a matter of do you are, are you willing to go through the hardship that come with it totally yeah and i think that's a very important thing is that you know anything worth having requires effort if everything was easy and handed to you on a plate then the value that you place on it is almost nothing because it was easy. You know, anything that is easy, I'm not saying it's completely worthless, but, you know, it it's nowhere near as valuable as those things that you've actually got to strive and struggle for. 100%. And, um, you know, I love getting all this wisdom as well from, you know, the, the, the top photographers out there, right? Um, and actually my podcast is not only about top photographers, but also like the newer one as well. Sure. I think the cool thing about talking to them is you you get to see the inspiration behind it, right? Mm. And it can become your own inspiration. So one of the um, guests that I speak to was my early mentor here in local in Perth area. And he says something that I'll never forget and something that still drives my passion and my career today is he always asks, don't ever forget why you start photography right? Yeah. Why you start photography. And that's how you can get out of this imposter syndrome of, you know, if you're in the NFT um, area, like you're not having sales for a long time. If mm -hmm. you're in a photography for sales, then maybe that's going to make you stop. 
Right? Yeah. <laughs> you're doing it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> exactly, right? If you're in photography for the adventure, man, the adventure never stops. You know, That's you just right. have to find a different way to make sales and find that money. So so then, you know, it's really important. And I got that from my guests. So it's, you know, it's it's really important to um, to, to speak to others and understand other people's journey and um, see how that can affect you. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the business side. So how are you structured? You mentioned you've got a number of things on the ball, like the, the backpack and uh, you're into NFTs and, and so forth. What else are you actually doing in your business and working on? And, okay, if there's some secrets, don't tell me, but you know, is there anything that you can share with us that sort of gives people a bit of a sense for how the business is structured, how it works, where the money comes from and how you keep it ticking over. Because for me, one of the things that I'm really interested in, I'm interested in learning for myself as well, but, you know, sharing that uh, knowledge of how people are actually building up their photography businesses. Because a lot of people, when they start out, they've got no real idea about what it is that they need to prepare, what they need to, you know, put in place to make sure that the income is always ticking over and how to diversify their income. And, you know, you've mentioned a couple of things, but I'm, I'm really interested in how you structure that to get your business working. Yeah. It's, um, you know, regardless, I think before we kind of uh, kind of go through this, um, you know, a lot of people might say, well, you know, doing a photography business is really tough, right? That's one thing that people love, uh, people say. Uh, but you also remember doing any business is tough. Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're running a milk bar or a pizza joint or... Exactly, uh, exactly. So making craft kinda... at home, you know? <laughs> 100%. Um, now, the question is, which one is worth it? I think that is the biggest question, right? So when I first started my photography, um, I I kind of try everything. I do portraits. I do maternity. I've done um, real estate resort. I've tried to be influencer at once, uh, at, at one point. Um, you know, basically every photography, I, I never go into commercial um because that was one of, uh, and wedding that was the two things that i know that i didn't want to get to yeah. um so how do you find um you know income from photography there are so many different ways to get income from money right uh, from photography right yeah. now the the big thing that you should do is um like I mentioned earlier, try out a few different things that you think you like, right? And see whether um, it is as good as you imagine it to be. Or is it just, you know, are you just looking at the good things and not considering the bad things? That's it. So once you find that out, you try a few different things. And then once you find that out, then um, stick with it. Stick with it, make it happen, make it sustainable before you take the next thing. Right. So if you're in prints, you stick with prints and you keep going, keep going, keep going. You make, you know, uh, an income or whatever goal you want to make from prints and then you go into the next thing. So so that is the main thing. And now for me myself, um, you know, the thing that I want to focus on is uh, mentorship and teaching. And, and that's where I do workshops like two days workshop. I do mentorship as well, you know, three monthly, six monthly um, I do one-on-ones if people just have like, you know, portfolio review that they want to um, go through or a certain question, I do that as well. Yep. Or, um, you know, in-person kind of meet up. And that's the thing that I want to focus on. Why? Because that's where I find the most fulfillment on. Now, mm-hmm. a lot of people can argue, well, you know, like you're in Bali, like doing this wedding photography is really profitable. It's like, yeah. And like, there's a lot of thing I could do that is good money. But when I quit my engineering career, I know I told myself that I would never pick a path based on money itself, right? It has to be something else that motivates that. Because you could could earn a lot more money in engineering than you can in photography. Easily. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. 
So, you know, if, if I were going to do, you know, something that I'm not going to enjoy in photography, then I might as well just stop this and go back to engineering and just do photography as my part time. Right. It's yes. no difference in that sense. So, That's so right. yeah, like um, there's a lot of different ways you can do prints, you can do NFTs, you can do um, uh, real estates. Right. Um, one of the easiest one to get started is, you know, the thing that people need. So portrait product photography. Um, real estate that's that's usually the easiest one because people yeah. genuinely need it yeah. right yeah. when it comes to prints it's it's different because it's about emotion it's about the the luxury yeah, it's, a, it's a luxury purchase exactly yeah yeah in terms of uh how you have decided to make that move to photography you talked a little bit about you know, changing careers from your engineering into full-time photography. How difficult was that decision and what were you sort of thinking about when you made that decision? What what did you weigh up in your mind before you said, okay, that's it? Yeah, it's, it's definitely the hardest decision that I've ever made. And, you know, going back to, to the culture that I was brought on, um, you know, that was never that was never on the radar <laughs> like i didn't even know that was possible so when i wanted to do that when i have the thought of pursuing that it was something that not even myself but most people in my you know families my circle of friends ever thought of or know that it's possible mm. right so it, making that decision of you know um getting that really nice salary from engineering here working for um, an aluminium refinery um to start over after what was that 29 years was really difficult because for 30 years or 29 years it's working towards this this level and i got there i finally yeah. got there and suddenly i want to throw it all away to start something new right now, one of the things that really helped me mm. was this book uh, from Tim Ferriss, right? The Four Hour Work Week. Yep. And one of the things that he said there is say, just write down the worst thing that could happen, right? And for me, my biggest fear is financially, right? What if it didn't work out, right? What yeah, if you got to feed yourself and house yourself. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, the the answer was simple i was like i used to work in subway and i used to still you know can i used to still save up stuff um, money to buy you know motorbike and luxury items so i was like well it's really not that bad the worst thing that could happen is just come back to australia work you know part time or full time on subway nando's or woolies or whatever yep. and you know i could look for another engineering job or whatever right so once I faced that fear, that biggest fear, then um, it, it was an easy decision. It's just a matter of when I'm gonna when I'm gonna pull the plug. Yeah, yeah. So when you decided, what were you putting into place before you pulled the pin? There must have been a bit of a plan to get to that point where you say, "Okay, today's the day." <laughs> yeah. Um, don't do what I do because I didn't have a plan. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to say what I recommend first. Right? Sure, sure. I recommend people to start doing it on um, on a, a part-time basis, right? Um, start doing this, um, save up a lot of money um, to at least sustain yourself for at least two years. I think, you know, two, three years, right? Um, so... And the next thing is to go on mini retirement. That's what Tim Ferriss does say. And what what do you mean by that? It's like, take a big break. So let's say you want to pursue full-time uh, photography, right? Take like a month break from your full-time job and treat it as if in that month you are, are the photographer that you want to do, right? Yeah. And see whether or not you enjoy it. If you enjoy it, then, right, that's an easy decision. If not, again, you got to keep finding out what you want to do in the future, right? And it, it goes with everything. It's not just photography. So I did that, but um, my whole premise about living my work was I want to spend 
a season in Canada in Canada um, to to just go skiing. Right, that's one thing. That's a bucket list thing that I have in my lot in my life. Yeah. And I was reaching thirty, which was the cutoff for you know working getting that visa at that time. Now they yeah, bump right. it out to thirty five. Um, <laughs> so it was an easy decision. Um, on my th- when I was twenty nine, um, I put on the visa. I thought it was gonna happen. Uh, it's gonna they're gonna come back in about a year or so. They come back in about three months and say, "Well, you got a year before you, you know you can come into um Canada. Yeah, you got any, um, you otherwise, you are visa." Yeah. So from there, then I just work backward. I know I wanted to explore Indonesia a little bit more and I want to drive around Australia with my four wheel drive at the time. So I just, you know, work backward. So I need to be in Canada at that time. You know, I, how long I want to be in, in Australia to drive around and how long I want to be in. And that is the time that I was going to quit. So yeah, um, I didn't have plan. I didn't know where to go. I didn't even know anyone who do this full time in the in the photography industry, right? Yeah, wow. Paul Ziska was the very first mentor and person who who does this full time as you know, like an adventure travel sort of things. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't know anyone yeah. to to ask and stuff like that. So it yeah, first two years I was just rolling around trying to figure things out, not knowing even what I could and should do. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a journey for sure it's uh it's crazy <laughs> sounds sounds like taking that spontaneous uh jump has has been good for you though how are you mm-hmm. feeling about the move now uh a couple of years on yeah um i mean you know the uh money comes and goes right and uh the thing is i don't base it on on money um i you know always find a way to to find that money when I need it and it's been okay so far. Um I can't say that I'm not where I want it to be. You know what what what, what I'm doing and what I want to do is not fully s- sustainable yet. So you know in some cases I still inject st- um financial uh finance from my um savings and so forth. Yep. But the first year you know when, when I leave that refinery for the last time I have never felt life in my life, right? I was just like everything lifted. Like I don't have this pressure. I don't have this judgment from, you know, I just like, wow, like I'm a whole new person. You're your own boss. And the first thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy, right? It's scary and it's exciting at the same time. You know, You, you, I'm actually, living my own life instead of living what the society and my parents think I should do. Mm. So I think based on that alone, you know, um, it's, it's already worthwhile. And the amount of experience that I get to experience in the first year alone doing this mm. is priceless. I would never be able to go to, to be able to capture experience and um, see some of this thing that I have captured during my trip. And yeah, it's 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 an experience. You know, one one thing just um to finish this up um when one big question that really motivated me was from Steve Job, and he say, if today were the last day of your life, would you do what you're about to do today? Yeah, and yeah. I used to have that written on my bathroom mirror and read it every single day until and I you know I kept reading it and the answer was was no until you know i start changing things and it start changing it's like yeah i would do that you know mm-hmm. so i think that's really important you know if you're not sure what you're gonna do if you're not sure that you should or shouldn't do it just ask yourself if today were the last day of your life would you do what you're about to do today perfect i think that's amazing advice yes. one of the questions that all artists have mm-hmm. is how do you price your work how do you go about pricing your work Oh, pricing is really difficult. I think I'm still struggling with pricing. Um, at the end of the day, um, one of the best advice that I've ever gotten was, "Why are you right?" You know, a lot of people say, "Hey, don't, don't, you know, don't undervalue yourself. Don't undervalue yourself." That is very true, right? Do not undervalue yourself. But at the same time, you need to believe that you are at that value, 
okay? Because if you are going to sell your price at, let's say, if, uh, let's just use um, portrait, for example, right? Yeah. If you're going to charge people $1,000 an hour, right? And you feel and you believe that your charge rate is $200 an hour, they will not purchase it. Hmm. Why? Because they will see, hesitate it when you put out the offer. You don't have the confidence. You don't truly believe that the value that you are given is at that price. Yeah. So then people then, you know, it's like, oh, it, yeah, I can't make money off this. You know, I'm, I'm struggling to sell and stuff like that. Well, that's because you don't truly believe on your own value. And, you know, if you don't believe on it, how can you expect your customer to believe in it? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So. Exactly. I agree with that sentence, right? Um, don't undervalue yourself. But at the same time, you need to build up to the value. Um, and I, um, you know, if if you want to value yourself higher and you don't believe that you're not there yet, then you need to convince yourself first, right? I'm not saying yeah. that you have to charge lower, but you need to do whatever it takes to convince yourself maybe to charge lower, right? To friends and family, maybe do a tryout just for free. Maybe do like, you know, things like meditation and stuff like that, right? To change the way you think, to change your belief. But mm. whatever it is, you need to make sure that you believe in that. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. It's uh, really good to, uh, I, I guess, take that belief and perception of where you are in the market and use that as a, a benchmark. I think that's a, that's really good advice. Yeah. In terms of shooting, you've uh, been, as you say, to 25 countries all around the world. Um, what's your favourite place to shoot? And have you been there yet? <laughs> 29 countries actually now. So 25 29. before I started photography, but now I'm like on 29 and um uh, my favorite so far is canada um 100 yeah. percent. you know um it the canadian Rockies is, is it's a playground for people who love adventures and you know during the summer you go hiking you chase this the auroras you chase the milky way and during winter you go back country snow um, snowboarding you snowboard and also like the harshest weather like i said produce the best photos you know so i have like a lot of um photo from my library where it's just truly one of a kind um mm -hmm. not not only because i know how to capture it and um, use the camera but also i was out on a time where people you know <laughs> most people don't want to go so, so um Whereas if you go, for example, in Indonesia, right, in Bali, right, um, yep. that is a lot more difficult because a lot of the places, um, you know, the, the weather is about the same. It's just a matter of is it going to rain or not, right? A little bit hotter, a little bit colder, but it doesn't have the snow. It doesn't have the change of color. It doesn't have the summer um, color, you know, while as in Canada, it, it, it changes so much. Every season is different. And I don't think you could ever get bored there because um, there's so many things to do. There's so many things to explore, even from one you know area or one mountain. Um, yeah. So, so far it would be Canada, uh, but yeah, I I don't know where where I'll end up in the future. Um, yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, right, um, one of my favorite road trip is Australia. So it really depends what you're asking for yeah. for photography and adventure, yeah. you know. Canada so far, but road trip um, is is Australia so far. Fantastic. How far would you travel each year? Sorry, say that again. How far would you travel each year? Uh, it depends. Um, I I don't have a set things. It's just a matter of what I want to where I want to go, what I want to see. Right. Um, if it's worth it, and if I if I feel like it's worth the experience, um, then I would go. Uh, but like I say, like I prefer to just take it slow and you know just stick on one place. So for example, when I was in Canada, um, I I was in the same place for about one and a half year, and wow. the main reason was because there's so many to explore that even in one and a half year, I'm nowhere close to where I, what I want to explore. Right. Yeah, sure. Um. 
for example, now in, in Indonesia, right, in Bali, right, um, it's a little bit smaller island, but there's still a lot of place that I want to explore that I haven't gone. And because I'm focusing more with the business side, then, you know, the time is a little bit restricted. So um, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how or, um, you know, as long as the money allows, <laughs> it doesn't really matter how far or how rough it is. If I, if there is an experience that I want to get out of that, then I would go out there and chase it. Yeah, great. What have you learned about the world through photography? That everything is beautiful in its own way. Um, I think that is the biggest thing that um, you can, it, it's, it's just, it all comes back to judgment, right? We are grown up with this judgment and labels like, you're, you know, you're, you're a landscape photographer, you're a portrait photographer, you're, you know, an adventure photographer. And we do need labels so that, you know, we, we can identify. You know, to describe what you're doing to somebody. Yeah. hundred percent. But like, we don't want to be able, we don't want to judge other people. And one of the things that I really don't like is this argument of, you know, uh, oh, composite or cheating or, you know, um, you know, single shot is better. It's like, there is no better. It's not right or wrong. It's just a matter of what is right for you. That is the important part. What's your artistic choice? But exactly. But you don't need to judge other people for your own decision, right? Um, I mean, if if you want everyone to be the same, just think about like a a MacBook, uh, a, a MacBook, for example. Everything looked the same, you know, <laughs> and it's it's not going to be interesting, right? Yeah, it becomes boring it, really quickly. The things that makes 100%, you know, the things that make life interesting is our personality, our differences. So I think it's important that we can embrace that and have an open mind. Just because they're doing it differently doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah, Totally. What's your worst photography experience? <laughs> oh, that depends. But I think the worst one that I've ever had uh, was when I dropped my 5D Mark IV. Um, I got 2470 um, 2.8 um, L series on that. And I went on top of Mount Agung. And at that time, I just recovered from injury. So I wasn't sure how much I could carry yet. So I just keep it light. I got one camera, two camera, two lens, um, and one tripod. Yep. So I, I was doing a time lapse from the crater with my um, 6D and uh, um, 1635. And mm-hmm. I wanted to do this self-portrait, but I only have one tripod. So I put it on top of this 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 rock and I kind of, you know, wedge it with another rock so that it's level and stuff like that. Do yep, a time yep. lapse and kind of walk around to the to the edge of the crater and do it do do my um my self portrait. But when I walk back, the wind just picked up and there was like a really massive wind. It knocks my camera over. It drops about 3 meters cliff. And it rolled down. So it drops down. And I every you know, when that happened, everything kind of just slowed down, right? And I was yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. like, what is that? I look at it and it's like, no, is that my camera? And it, it hits the ground. And I was like, that is my camera. And it just kept rolling. And I was like running. I was like, no. And I was like, I thought it never gonna stop because it yeah. like it was like rolling, rolling, rolling. And then at some point it kind of slowed down and it got rolling again. And it must have been about 30, 50 meters down where I was standing until it stopped. So I walk all the way down there, picked up the camera. You know, it was an error. I unclipped the, the lens, look at it, clip it back on, and it was good as new. And I was like, whoa. Wow. So it's that was incredible. But I, I, my heart skipped that day. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, amazing. Uh, I guess a, a testament to the build of uh, the, the the Canon gear to uh, th- that it actually survived the the fall. Yeah, hundred percent. And I I I feel like the the newer one, you know, the mirrorless might not survive that. I guess all the mm-hmm. electronics and stuff. But that that camera is crazy. Um, I've dropped it 
three times really badly. Um, you know, one in New Zealand where yeah. I was like hopping, skipping on a, this big rocks, boulders, and I s- missed one and I fell because I was holding like a tripod and a camera on one end. I fell camera first hitting, you know, the rock. Oh, no. And that was fine. A change of uh, filter. And the second one was on um, Cape York, the northernmost part of Australia. And there was another big gush of wind. Tripod went all the way down, hit lens first to the rock. Lens was fine. Um, And then this one. Uh, But having said that, you know, um, last year when I went to Nepal, that lens actually failed. So (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm still surprised that it it goes through all that. uh, And it's incredible. Kind of, you know, uh, okay, but yeah, it, it did finally give up. You talked a little bit about uh, your process in terms of finding uh, compositions and so forth. What things are you looking for in terms of that and what do you do when you turn up to a location? You've obviously got a bit of a workflow or do you just sort of let the landscape speak to you and uh, you work your way around it? Yes. Um, one of the things that I always um, told my mentee is slow down, right? And observe. Mm-hmm. When you think about it, the thing that we capture is we the things that we see with our eyes, right? Now, our brain and our eyes is the most advanced photography ever. Mm. Uh, the most advanced camera ever, right? When you see it, it recognizes it. Oh, yeah, that is beautiful. But because it happens so quickly, you kind of have to slow down and reverse engineer it and work and um, think about what actually makes it beautiful. And Mm. then you can use your camera to translate that. So next time you, you know, go on a trip, you walk around somewhere and you kind of stop and then you like, you kind of look like, oh, that that kind of, you know, attract me there's something about it that i really like just slow down a little bit and think about what attracts it yeah uh it might be the colors it might be the shape it might be the layers and all of this is uh, a composition um part of a composition technique that you could put together yeah right um i think in in my master class there's about four i break it out to 34 that you could put together and create what psychologically we think are beautiful. So once you recognize that, then think about how, what is the story that you want to tell and how can you capture it with your camera in order to um, portray what you see, what you feel, and what you want to tell to the audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the biggest thing, you know, because with the camera nowadays, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're so advanced. You don't need to you know work too much with it right but the biggest thing that will set your photography apart with 10,000 10 million other people out there is how you see the world and how you um, translate that into your photography yeah yeah great how about post-processing are you one to come back from a trip straight to the computer upload get into editing or do you let it gestate and marinate for a little while and get into it a little bit later yeah post-processing is another thing um it's it it, i I used to not like post-processing but the more i do it i the more i love it because it's it's like experiencing it twice right you you Mm -hmm. take a photo of it and then you see it and then you export it so with the post-processing i usually um it depends I'll, i'll love to go straight to it you know i get excited when i get home i upload it and i usually filter out so i would go through it and find my favorite one yep and edit those two just because i edit you know the two the three or the five whatever handful that i really like doesn't mean there are no good photos apart from that so usually i come back a little bit later when i have time but one of the things that I really enjoy is watching a movie, a series or whatever, right? So not mm-hmm. technically not watching because the attention is on your uh, screen and editing. But yeah, I like to run that on the background and then edit at the same time. I just find yeah. a lot of peace in that. I, I don't know why. So 
Yeah, um, I just got a new MacBook Pro, so I'm I'm excited to uh, to test this out and see because uh, my old one giving me so much trouble and lags um, when I edit. Um, I got like two hundred thirty thousand photos on my library so far, so <laughs> it really struggles. <laughs> I got to. I got to admit, it, it is one of the reasons why I don't use uh, Lightroom. I have so many images that I know that the database that it creates is going to be almost as heavy as the images. It, you know, I know that's not true, but it, it it feels that way. And you know, so I I actually don't don't use Lightroom at all, simply because I don't want to have that database uh, set up taking up space for one thing, but also when you load Lightroom into your uh, memory on your PC, a lot of people don't realise a lot of that database is actually being cached into your RAM. And so you end up with that being a, a bottleneck for actually processing because then that leaves less RAM for processing the images that you actually want to process. And I know yeah, there's no. I know there's some things going on in the background to swap stuff out and everything, but you know, it it, it can actually have exactly that problem where you your your older machines in particular are, are starting to slow down unless you've got uh, you know like sixty four gig of RAM or one hundred and twenty four gig of RAM, you, you're going to end up uh, running out of space. Yeah, hundred um, percent. There are um, you know things around it, um, like you could limit the cache but yeah. the other thing that um, you, you're talking about is with the size of the file you could actually not create preview or smart preview that's so right then you yeah. only there are ways of doing it yeah yeah but I, I actually like the smart preview because I'm carrying like four different so my photos are spread out into four different hard drive five terabyte hard drive because they're yeah. all full so you know, being able to connect, uh, edit without connecting my hard drive is a big plus. So I'd rather yeah. take that hit and, you know, have three, I think it was 300 gigabyte of um, smart preview. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. So when, when you are editing, what are you, what are you doing to your images? Are you lots and lots of layers and lots of, uh, you know, fancy edits or are you fairly minimalistic? Uh, a little bit a little bit of um a little bit of both it really depends on the photo as well um right. for me i try to do everything on lightroom as much as possible right and yeah. then i need to take it out then i export it to photoshop um and then you know it when you save it it kind of import it back to lightroom that's one of the thing that i like about the system uh but Usually, I only edit on Photoshop when I do luminosity masking. So when there is a massive dynamic range, that yep. especially on the highlights and stuff that I want to recover. Because um, when you shoot um, sunset and sunrise and so forth, usually the color get washed out because of that dynamic range. So yep. using that luminosity masking, you could bring that color back in. Um, for that brightness alone, not for the whole photo. Uh, yeah. But in most cases, I do everything on 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 the Lightroom. Uh, most of the stuff that Lightroom have is it's enough to be able to edit. So, yeah, I I don't um I I don't work too much with with editing. I think a lot of things that um the things that I do a lot in Lightroom is the selective tool. I like to dodge and burn and create an experience in in my photography like where it goes you know what what i want them to see first or notice first and what i want them to kind of experience next sure. that is the one that i always think about when i edit my photo yeah cool what do you say is the biggest challenge facing photographers right now <clears throat> in terms of just photography or like um in doing full-time photography uh, no, just in photography in general. The biggest challenge. Um, <clears throat> there is a couple of things, right? Um, I think the biggest challenge is that uh, people are... So <laughs> I got this ebook that called The Forgotten Secret of Photography. And it's basically talking about how 
we forget that photography is about what you see. Yep. Right. Um, most people get so caught up on the gears and uh, you know having the the latest gears, mm-hmm. the latest this, the latest that, uh, but never work and sharpen the way they see the world, the way um, the way they visualize things. So, I think with the instant culture that we have right now, one of the biggest challenge is the under appreciation of how important our visual and our vision are Um, because people just expect that you know expensive camera expensive phone can just capture it for you well it's at the end of the day like you know like my camera is sitting on a backpack it doesn't go out and take its own photo that's right right? (laughs) you start to take it out so have to point out the, the things that you want to take photo um but yeah so so with that in mind i think that is the biggest struggle and challenge in photography and i i think most people don't realize that mm. Mm. great what's the future of photography oh this is interesting isn't it i mean you start looking at ai and stuff like that and to me it all comes back to why you start photography, right? That's why that question is so important. Um, you know, a lot of people go to AI and a lot of people say, it's like, well, you know, actually my uncle said that in, in one of our group chats, like, look, like this beautiful landscape is like using AI. Like you don't even go out there. I was like, well, it's great, but I didn't take photo because I want a beautiful photo i actually want to explore yeah it's you not want like to i want to aura yeah, photo. Yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah i mean i i could i, could like ask, I want to aura photo i i could ask sorry, uh, sorry, go ahead. journey to you know make me a seascape but it doesn't put the sand between my toes and the water flowing around my legs you know 100 <laughs> percent, right i mean it's like oh, oh you know i i um i like racing um motorbike so i'll just buy a view the video, yeah. my, um, my it's, it's, it, it doesn't work like that it, the, the experience is different That's and it's right. the same with the phone as well a lot of people say ah you know um dslr is gonna be obsolete well people are still shooting film you know it's not always about the the photo it's about mm-hmm. the experience you get from um taking the photo so more than ever i think it's important that people understand and remember why they start photography in the first place because otherwise they'll get sucked in into this media and you know idealism that people should and you know should be this way should be that way and so yeah yeah totally agree so there any photographers out there that you think i should be talking to paul zisco he's on my list (laughs) yeah he's uh he's um he's such a humble person he's a really good person um and he's a great photographer and he is one of the person uh one of the photographer that i can look and see that i you know i i want to strive to be right yep. um, one of the reasons why is because he go through um just basically most of the principle that i say today about going out there it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what what the condition are right he he can spontaneously look at different things and appreciate different things that most people doesn't look at um, one a good example is like when people go to uh, canadian rockies and go to this popular lake called abraham lake people yep. only go there for the bubbles right but he would like go out there and find these crazy ice features or crazy shapes or textures and just capture it and you go like huh why didn't I think of that? Or, yeah, yeah. or why yeah. didn't you know 10 million others think of that? Um and you know one other thing is that he has such a, a positive and inspiring voice as well um mm. in, in in his um in his message and journey and photography so if there's one person i mean there's a lot of people that i, I can recommend right um uh, the easiest way is just go through the podcast list uh, right. but all these guys one of the person that i truly admire and um, i truly respect in this in this um industry and you know he always tried to give back he he, he does a lot of causes for 
um um ice conservation and stuff like that because he also mm -hmm. loved going to the um ice caves and yeah. glacier and so forth yeah. so yeah um i think that that would be the, the the person fantastic thank you very much i got one more question for you and it's uh for some of my listeners the most important one that i ask do you like pineapple on pizza I don't like pineapple, so that's an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not like pineapple? <laughs> I, 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 I'm horrible. I'm, I'm such you a. Come from a tropical fan. island. I, I, I don't, I don't like fruits and I don't like vegetable. That's how horrible my diet is. And wow. um, I, I used to grow up, uh, grew up on um, instant noodles for ten years or something. Wow. All I ate was just <laughs> instant noodles and. It's probably why I'm so short, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could well be. Well, thank you very, very much for taking the time to talk to me today, Stanley. It's been absolutely wonderful getting to know you better and uh, getting to know how you do what you do. Where can people find your work? Yeah, uh, I appreciate it, actually. Thank you very much for letting me share some of this because most of the time I, you know, I'm where you're sitting and, you know, um, get to ask the question instead. Um, but I love what you're doing with the podcast. It's really in, uh, incredible to see a lot of the, the speakers and um, sharing their journeys and stuff like that. So I'm really enjoying this. Um, for most people who want to, you know, um, join the Wicked Hunt, so to speak, um, and my journey in photography, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Faro, as well as face Facebook, and it's just mm -hmm. at the Wicked Hunt, uh, W I C K E D H U N T, and um, the name actually come from, um, come back to that to that whole notion why I do photography. Um, you know, the photography is not the main thing. It's the awards that I get when I go hunt for this wicked photos yeah. and wicked um, moments, I suppose, right? Um, that's why it's called Kid Hunt. Uh, but, you know, um, I got a website as well on the Wicked Hunt. But if you want to, you know, chat, if you want to talk, if you want to say hi, Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, it's probably the best um, to just, you know, um, send me a DM. I'm, I'm, my, my DM is open and I might not be able to get to you right away, but I always reply to everyone's DM. Fantastic. Thanks very much, uh, Stan. Oh, and uh, any, uh, you mentioned your backpack, any date for when that could be due? Is it next year, the year after, or is it still too early to say? No, it's it's been it's very exciting. Um, I've you know I've got to very close now. We've got into the fifth prototype now. It's it's crazy, um, but uh, we are hoping to release uh, to have this ready this year and release twenty exclusive backpack for the founding members, right? And we're looking for people who are are truly believe on our journey and what we want to make out of this um this uh, vision mm -hmm. and what you get for being a founding member is um you know you, you're basically gonna be grandfather a grandfather in into uh, you know what we're doing and you will get to be exclusive you you'll get exclusive exclusive access to everything that we're gonna do in the future you get exclusive prize um, as well as all the benefits that you that are gonna come in in the future, as well as you know uh, a, 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 an early early bird prize that comes with it. Now uh, for founding members, we'll um, also personalize the backpack, so it's gonna be like a, a patch that you know you could put whatever engraving you want in there, whether it's your photography name, your name, and so forth. But at the end of the day, what we're hoping is to be able to help photographers out there to carry more or get of their stuff, right? Their gears into adventures, mm -hmm. uh, while minimizing having few different backpacks, like you know, hiking backpacks, camera backpacks, and so forth, and having the comfort. I think that is one thing that I can't find from most photography backpack is that that comfort when you take it into a different adventures and so forth. So yeah, um. The, the brand is called Two Red Taps. Um, we're, we haven't even done anything yet in there. We've been focusing so much on the backpack 
tech itself. Yep. Uh, but if that's yep. something that you're interested in, um, you can you know get in touch with me and um, ask questions. And, and at the moment, for the 20, actually do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with them, showing them the exact features and, um, you know, uh, get any feedback that they have or any objection and so forth from that backpack. But they get like a personalized one-on-one -on -one meeting with me to to kind of see what the backpack and the experience like. But Thank I appreciate you. you asking that. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. I, I didn't want to uh, leave the uh, the question unanswered in people's minds about when uh, when they could get hold of them. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Stanley. Thank you very much, Grant. I uh, very much enjoyed this conversation and hopefully we get to meet and shoot together in, um, you know, in the near future. Absolutely. That'd be fantastic. Really look forward to it. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.